Welcome to Polka's Geek. Uh, if you've not joined us before, I hope you find this video useful. If you have, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about renal ultrasound. And in this video, uh, hopefully briefly, we'll be able to discuss how to image the kidneys bilaterally and to image the bladder and some of the findings, uh, the normal findings we should see with them. In hopefully future videos, I'll be able to go over some of the pathology that may be seen and help you with that. So if you've been with us before, uh, we always talk about or I always talk about binary questions. When we use point of care ultrasound, we should have very focused goals in what we're looking for. Really, in renal ultrasound, we have two binary questions, and that is, is there hydronephrosis? That can be either unilateral or bilateral. And is there urinary retention? And we can um, understand that by estimating the bladder volume through some calculations. Now, there are some subsequent what else questions that we also need be, that are also binary, but that we should be able to identify. We will not go over these today, um, but like I said, and hopefully in future videos, I'll be able to have some examples there for you. But those are, is there free fluid? This can be important in someone that has hydronephrosis and they could have a calyx seal rupture. Also, you could have some perinephric fat stranding that can cause some free fluid, which are signs of uh, inflammation on the kidney, and that should be identifiable as those are uh, significant complications when it comes to uh, the kidney. Additionally, uh, we don't want to get confused. Uh, somebody that has hematuria, we don't want to miss a renal mass that could be signs of a renal cell carcinoma and just diagnose this as um, a kidney stone or something else. So we need to be able to identify those. Additionally, we should be able to identify cysts that are present. Now those cysts can become complicated and or show signs of cancer, whether they are septate or have internal debris, which could be conversion to a renal abscess, and those should also be identifiable. Additionally, when we're evaluating the bladder, we can sometimes appreciate a ureteral stone um, that gives us a more definitive diagnosis in the case that we're evaluating for ureteral lithiasis, um, and that can be helpful. And then also, not something that I do personally frequently, but you can evaluate for ureteral jets. I don't find this as useful because it takes quite a bit of time to get them uh, shown as present. It can take up to five minutes for a ureteral jet to be present and um, it's not always easy to find and it doesn't if they're not present um, it doesn't really change outcome for me or if i'm not able to find them i should say they're, they're not present they're present but i may not be able to see that so when we do renal ultrasound um, really anytime you're considering the urinary tract as being a cause of pathology for the patient you can use re uh, renal ultrasound and that's whether they have recurrent UTIs or a single time UTI, maybe acute, acute kidney failure. Those are times to, I think, look at the kidneys in the point of care setting, determine if there's any type of obstruction or any other secondary signs of inflammation that we need to be looking for. Um, but a lot of times we're gonna think of this, especially in people with flank pain, back pain, um, blood in their urine, those type of things, or if somebody's unable, comes in and says they're unable to urinate. When we look at the kidney, this is just a quick reminder of the anatomy of the kidney. This is a uh, sagittal cut of the kidney down the middle so that we can see the renal pelvis and what it looks like and how the vessels come in and surround the medullas through the renal pyramids and how we have the emptying system <clears throat> that uh, joints to be the renal pelvis. And that's really what we're gonna focus on a lot is if there's hydronephrosis in that, and then we're surrounding the kidney to see if there's any signs of inflammation or free fluid um, that would mean secondary complications. When we go to do renal ultrasound, you need a low frequency probe so it can penetrate deeper into the body. You can use either a phased array or a curvilinear. My preference is a curvilinear. That does make it more difficult to look between the ribs. However, I think you have a little bit better lateral resolution. Um, and I think with some techniques, you can still image the kidney well. Some people really like the phased array because they can shoot through those ribs better, but I feel like the resolution isn't quite as good. That's really a personal preference or 
even depends on what you have available to you, but either one would be fine to use. When we look at the kidneys, we're going to remember that they lie with their cortex out to our lateral sides bilaterally, and the pelvis is dire typically directed towards the spine or medial. Here we show the kidney, and we're going to put our probe and look in it in this plane. Probe marker towards the head when we're looking at this um, cut of the kidney, this long axis cut. And what we're going to see is essentially this view that we have here. And if we put some drawing on that, we can see clearly our liver, kidney, and psoas. Now remember where we're touching the probe or touching the patient out here, we were lateral. And then we're going towards the spine, which is here in our far field. This is towards our head. We see cephalad. We can see the liver. And then we can see the psoas or caudal. We're going to see the inferior pole of the kidney. Now one thing that's important to remember is we need to see the entire kidney at some point when we're looking in both the long and short axis. Now, in this particular image, we were able to see it all. We can see right along the right along the kidney here. We can define all the borders. We can make sure there's no masses coming off of it. And that's what we need to do. We need to define that entire kidney. So if you have to do this in one, two, three plus images, that's fine. But as long as you see that entire kidney to make sure you don't see any masses, cysts, any other complications, but you can appreciate that. Now, additionally, we need to focus right here on this renal pelvis that we see. And we wanna make sure that we can identify that renal pelvis because that's how we're gonna tell whether there's hydronephrosis or not. When we see that hyperechoic area in here as we do here, that's gonna typically not be hydronephrosis, but that's where you'll first see it start to distend as it extends out towards the medullas and the cortex there. So this is just superimposing that drawing on it. This is about the angle we would see. And in this one, it, you know, we're appreciating where that pelvis is and that's really we, what we want to be able to see. Now, part of the problem is, is when we're imaging in these areas, is that we have rib shadows that get in the way. Now, if it only catches a little bit of the kidney, that's fine. We can make decisions or uh, make diagnoses based off of that, but we still have to see this area of the kidney that's obscured. Now even worse is if it's here, we lose all of that information, whether it be down through here. And, you know, we won't typically see this. This is, you know, extra numerary ribs probably, but um, we can appreciate that ribs are difficult to image between, and you have to really identify the kidney um, throughout the entire long axis at some point. So you can make sure there's no masses. Now, one trick to this, probably the easiest trick, is to have the patient take a deep breath, and that will typically push the, that kidney more inferior uh, for you and help you. Additionally, you can use fanning and rotation techniques to look between those ribs, or use the phased array probe or different techniques like that to see it. But in the end, what you need to do is you need to see the entire kidney in the long axis before moving on to the short axis. Now, when we look in the short axis, what we're going to see, we're going to turn our probe marker towards the patient's spine. We're going to do this both sides, on the right and the left. And then we're going to see an image somewhat like this, at least in the right upper quadrant. We'll see that liver tip coming down. Now remember, we are touching the probe on this side, and this is medial, because we're in the lateral field. And this is towards spine. And then over here, is anterior and that's why we see the liver as we do there now let me get rid of that there now when you're imaging in the short axis it's important that you see the entire thing so you can fan you can fan up to the superior pole and then fan down through the inferior pole but you have to see that entire kidney in a short axis you can also drag up to the superior pole and drag inferior or you can use a combination of the two and work between the ribs to um, drag between them and then fan, as long as you see the entire kidney at some time. Now, if we see here, we can see this short axis view. We can see the liver right here. And we see the kidney right here. And right here in the center, we can see the renal pelvis. And that's where we're gonna look for that hydronephrosis. We're gonna be looking for any secondary issues that we have, free fluid surrounding it, cysts, any masses, those type of things.
This, we're gonna fan up to the superior pole, as you can still see the liver there, and then we're gonna make sure we image the inferior pole, and we see that liver disappear. Now, when we talk about the kidneys, they have a typical size. Not everybody's the same size, so they can vary a little bit. What's most important is you probably look at the kidneys in the individual, compare them bilaterally, and get their sizes from that. However, if you're measuring the size, Typically, the length is going to be between 10 and 12 centimeters. And you don't have to do a lot of memorization once you can remember that, other than you have to divide by two. So the width of the kidney is going to be typically five to six. We see this also in a short axis that it's five to six. And then the depth should be two to three centimeters. So as long as you can remember, initially it's 10 to 12 centimeters and then divide by two, you're going to know your sizes generally well. But like I said before, Make sure you compare the two sides and see what that uh, shows you. If one's enlarged compared to the other, you know, that could be concerning for inflammation to the kidney. Um, and so you should really pay attention to both sides and compare those. Now, when we image the left kidney, it typically sits more superior and more posterior. This gets a little harder to work between the ribs, but you can. You can rotate the probe a little bit clockwise on the left to image between the ribs, that may help. Also, you can have the patient roll up into a right lateral decubitus position and go a little more posterior than the, more towards the um, posterior axil axillary line or even a little bit further. And that may help you get um, around those ribs to see. And as what image you're gonna see, much like if you do fast exams, you're gonna be seeing the spleen towards the head and then the kidney. And then you may see the psoas in our smaller individuals you're going to get a view like this. Now, if you notice in this drawing, and I did this on purpose, was to show you that, you know, we don't see the entire kidney. So in the left, I typically um, will have to do two images, just whether it be you can't get the entire kidney in the view um, just because of the window or because there are rib shadows. You really need to make sure you see the entire kidney at some point. So if we look at this image here, what becomes valuable to us is we can see this part of the kidney and we can appreciate that. Now we have, what we have unfortunately, is we have a rib, rib right there and all this becomes kind of obscured. And we have it a little, um, it's a little too dark over in this area. But what does work for us is this. This is still um, identifiable. We can tell what's going on there. And all we have to do is we have to just move down. So in this example, we move further down, we're able to see the entire kidney. So if we remember before, this was our area that we could tell, and this was all the area we couldn't. Now, between the two images, we've seen the entire kidney and we're able to assure that there's no masses or cysts coming off this kidney. And that's really important that we do a full assessment of that kidney. Now, just like the right kidney, we're gonna do short access on the left. You can use those same techniques of fanning and or dragging, even some rotation to work between the ribs, but you need to see the entire thing at some point. What we see here is we're gonna see, this is um, lateral. So this is lateral. And here's medial at the far field. Okay, now, this is towards the spine, and then this is uh, anterior. All right, so we have identified, we'll see the spleen typically towards the lateral portion because we're using that as our window. Then we'll see kidney and then psoas. And then all of this kind of area here, you're gonna see a lot more bowel gas. You're gonna have what they call dirty shadowing. You're gonna see a hyperchoic line along here, and then kind of a bright but brightish shadow uh, initially and that will get dark in or uh, far from that or in the far field from that and that's pretty typical because the spleen's not as big it can be a little more difficult to image this side um, but you can do it well um, but make sure you fan drag and get the whole uh, kidney on the right side in this video for time's sake I've only included an image of this so you can see the spleen like we talked about here and then our, here's our kidney, and here's our spine and the psoas in between the kidney and the spine. 
Um, you should get the superior and inferior pole in addition, um, but for time's sake, we're gonna move on. Now, you're gonna look at the bladder next. Um, and I like to start in a long axis on the bladder. I think it's the easiest way to find the bladder, whether that be in men or female. The long axis is useful in this uh, to help us I quantify size, but I think the short axis is just a little bit better because we can look for the ureters, look for any distal ureteral stones or obstruction. Um, and, uh, but they're both useful together in measuring quanti or qu uh, size of the bladder. Now, right here, this is going to get a little hard because uh, it's hard to identify this in a single image. But right here and right there are your ureters. Now, this is your right. This is your left of the patient. And what we're going to see in the video is you're going to pay attention that the ureters are going to track like this. You'll have to watch them. They'll be hypo to anechoic structures tracking back that way is there's some fanning. And that's where you're going to look along the course of them to see if there's anything within them, uh, such as a stone. So here we have a video. Go ahead and watch that, and you'll see those structures as they go there. And you're not going to be able to track them a long ways because then bowel gas starts to get in the way. And you, um, but you will be able to see them somewhat, and that's where you're going to look for your stones. All right, so at times it may be important to measure a bladder volume. Most of the time we can look at it and appreciate that, you know, is this a distended bladder or not? But at times you may want to get a bladder volume or estimate that. This is one of many equations out there. Um, the truth is I don't calculate this by hand. I use the machine to calculate this for me. What I've been able to find is that this is usually within 25% give or take, but is not exactly accurate compared to the voided or catheterized samples that people are getting after doing these measurements. But I do think it's um, very useful to visualize the bladder and then to take these measurements. I think it's more useful than using a bladder scanner personally. So what we're going to do is we're going to get in the bladder in a long axis and we're going to measure the length first. So this is our um, superior and this is our inferior portion. We're going to measure that length we can, in the same view, measure the depth of the bladder. Make sure you save your, your measurements before moving on. We can also measure the same depth in the short axis. You don't have to remeasure it, but you can get the depth in either measurement. But then you'll need to measure your width. And you want to make sure that you're measuring the largest portion in any one of these measurements. If you save each one of those, it will the machine will calculate a volume for you. And like I said, it's usually within 25% either above or below, but it gives you an idea of what the volume, uh, the estimation of the volume is. And once again, here's the equation if you need that. I hope you found this helpful to you today. Um, if you have any questions about this or any other point of care um, issues, feel free to email me at pocusgeek at gmail.com or feel free to leave comments below about this video or uh, other suggested videos. Um, like I said, I think renal ultrasound is definitely a useful study to do to assist our patients, and I hope you find it useful too moving forward. And feel free again to let me know if you have any questions. Um, feel free to click on the subscribe button and or any of the videos that will be posted here as links at a later time. Have a great day.